Um, so thank you, Janus and the Axioma team for inviting me. It's been a pleasure to work with them and to be here, and I'm quite excited, so it might come out as being nervous, which I also am. Uh, so please just bear with me. I'm an artist, graphic designer, and educator based in Rotterdam. And for the last three years, I've been immersed in the world and history of secret communication, particularly with one method, namely invisible ink. I activate, make, and research ways to revive invisible ink in light of contemporary surveillance. I also share practical information and its political and social dimensions. Um, invisible ink is uh, one of the oldest forms of steganography, which is the art and science of hiding um, in plain sight. And historically speaking, it was elusively steeped in alchemy, magic, and mystery. So invisible ink can be made with um, sophisticated chemical formulas um, in a laboratory, or you can use also simple household um, ingredients such as milk, lemon juice, starch, baking soda, and even bodily fluids such as um, saliva, urine, blood, and semen. Um, interestingly enough. <laughs> Uh, so, Tactics and Poetics of Invisibility is the title for this project and body of work that I've developed over the years. Uh, this is the documentational website where I keep an overview. Um, this project on one hand aims to resuscitate obsolete low-tech and analog secret communication as a tactic to evade novel high-tech and digital surveillance. On the other hand, this project also aims to co-create alternative modes of communicating. Um, how can we protect ourselves from surveillance while still being visible to our peers? How can we build and strengthen community, uh, community bonds through poetic modes of communication? I've developed a body of work that has expressed itself in various forms, such as talks and workshops. This one was done in um, Raika in Croatia at a festival called Mine, Yours, Ours. This is uh, some workshops in Rotterdam and also in Raika. I've also manifested some interactive pieces in which um, they're quite performative. And at the moment I'm working on publishing a toolkit which includes uh, the recipes of invisible ink to make at home, um, historical examples and an essay written by myself. Basically, it's an extended version of this lecture. Uh, so to go back to the beginning, the inspiration for this project came from this article that really gripped my imagination and curiosity. Um, the article talks about how the CIA had declassified World War I invisible inks recipes. And despite the military incentives, I was really impressed by the inventiveness and creativity one that not only artists can lay claim to. Um, the recipes describes how to carry invisible ink in your clothes. Spies are instructed to um, soak in their handkerchiefs <coughs> or collar with invisible ink so they're not caught with it, since uh, if you were caught carrying the ink or some chemical substance or some kind of accessory like a pen, a biro pen, which is now very common, but back then was not so common, you could be incriminated and executed. So it was a serious issue. <laughs> um, so according to the article from 2011, the CIA had released these documents because they had considered that these old documents are now harmless, no longer posing a threat to national security because advanced digital technology has rendered them obsolete and useless. So triggered by a comment uh, in a similar article, I also questioned whether these old techniques were as innocuous as they were considered. The commenter indeed seems to have pointed out the weakness of online communication, namely the issue of interception. So if a letter is intercepted, one can see when it's been opened, giving signs of tampering, and this is much harder to detect in emails or other digital messages, and thus the commenter has questioned whether this old technology is as irrelevant as reported. Um, because the majority of people also conduct their communications <coughs> digitally, making most of our online activities trackable and recordable and commodifiable, I wondered if perhaps resorting to paper and invisible ink was perhaps safer 
for two reasons. Namely, that um, number one, paper is not uh, smart. Uh, it can't send information back to servers around the world and it won't send data inadvertently to third parties. And number two, for the very fact that it's considered unthreatening. Perhaps the overlooked does not draw attention and therefore is potentially more safe. Um, so in 1968, Andy Warhol fam famously said, in the future, everyone will be famous for 15 minutes. Um, today, many would agree that in the future, everyone will be anonymous for 15 minutes. Uh, in 2006, Eric Klautenberg and Howard Rheingold wrote an essay called Mindful Disconnection, Countering the Panopticon from the Inside. It talked about how the technologies that, the very technologies that allowed widespread creation of culture, political self-organization, also supported um, unprecedented surveillance capabilities and surveillance not only by the state, but by spammers, stalkers, and the merely, merely curious, and also trollers, as I will talk about um, shortly. Um, and in 2011, uh, the internet critic Eugene Morozov similarly expresses that in his book called Net Delusions, the Dark Side of the Internet, the Dark Side of Internet Freedom. So he talks about how contrary to the populist cyber utopian belief stemming from the 1990s that technology empowers oppressed people, dictators would masterfully learn to use it for propaganda purposes instrumentalizing it for sophisticated systems of surveillance and censorship. Um, and what this brings to my mind is the national reputation system currently under construction by the Chinese government called the social credit system. Uh, this system hasn't been built, or well, it's kind of in uh, development, but it hasn't been made a national system, but it's intended to rate every citizen's trustworthiness based on government data regarding their social and economic status. Um, but it's also determined by your friends, your family, employers and enemies that can rate you based on how you behave and what you buy and what you do and what nice things you say or what horrible things you say or do. Um, in 2013, uh, 19, <laughs> Snowden, leaked NSA files which proved and confirmed that the US government is working together with internet corporations to track and hack into your phone calls, emails, and online activities. So to put it simply, this is an information asymmetry, a power imbalance, if you will. Um, and Felix Stelder sheds light on this by critiquing the current regime of transparency because transparency in today's neoliberal era is synonymous with institutional good practice. So for him, um, in this context, transparency that is bottom up or bottom up visibility where communities and people demand visibility to structures of powerful accountability can be empowering. However, top down visibility where the state demands visibility as a control and disciplinary measure leads to what he calls an information asymmetry. So he suggests, but he also suggests particular forms of visibility for social solidarity, where people can come together and see one another and experience zones of mutual, mutual, mutuality. Um, so the struggle for power balance um, articulates itself differently in each era, bringing new challenges that constantly requires a rethinking of modes of resistance. And a historical example of a top-down control method or measure is this interesting imaginative uh, <laughs> and also quite um, sinister kind of fictional technology because it was never really actually built but it was a kind of um, imagination of a Jesuit priest. So it's called the Panacoustican and it was built or built, it was imagined 120 years before Jeremy Bentham's Panopticon. And he imagined um, a one-way eavesdropping device for elites um, in the top chamber to listen in on the common folk on the ground. And these kind of spirals are kind of to amplify their sound and to keep an eye out on what they're doing. So you can say that this is one research question for my project, for my own personal aim. 
could the use of invisible ink um, that is analog and offline steganography be used to tactically block top-down top um, surveilling powers? Um, however, surveillance these days is not only a common top-down practice for governmental and corporate powers, but more recently has become a weapon for the alt-right, a neo-fascist movement that uses online media to spread hate speech. Um, last December, Ghost Ship, Ghost Ship a self-organized DIY venue was burnt down in Oakland, California. The alt-right have attacked these spaces, calling them open hotbeds of liberal radicalism and degeneracy. <laughs> uh, so according to this local news website, um, they have, and now I'm going to quote, they have mentioned that sites like 4chan and Reddit have seen the emergence of threads in which alt-right users encourage each other to post addresses of houses that host concerts and other cultural programming around the country, and to call local authorities to report safety and building code violations in hopes of getting the venues shut down. So as a result, these underground spaces have made the decision to go back to announcing their shows um, more through word of mouth than the internet. And these spaces have literally gone underground or offline in search of alternative forms of safer communication. Um, so what is really the, the tactical potential of paper and invisible ink? Um, here is a kind of pro and con kind of chart. Uh, so obviously one of the strengths is that it's um, more secure because it's not connected to the internet. It's easily destructible. You can get rid of it. Um, making, copiers, making copies is less easier than copying digital information. Um, although interception is possible, it's time consuming and um, it's also easier to detect if, when interception by a third party. A weakness is of course also the s slowness, so it can also be a strength, but it also can be um, kind of preventing people from actually doing it because uh, nowadays we're so kind of used to and fet fetishize convenience. Um, and because of the snow slowness, it can become, it can only really operate on a local level or a, with smaller distribution circles. And the whole process of writing a letter, printing it or, or whatever, writing it out is also more time consuming. And the postal service is also becoming more expensive and run by private companies. So um, the former NSA whistleblower, Edward Snowden, uh, suggested digital cryptography. However, the reality is that the level of sophistication is too advanced for the majority of people without a computer science background. Moreover, even with digital encryption, emails can still be hacked by governments. Um, after all, in the last scene of the documentary of S Snowden called Citizen 4, they resort to paper and pen to communicate. So this is a screenshot of um, that documentary. So in a world where offline sites will become increasingly scarce and therefore possibly a luxury safe haven, anonymity will be an, a product highly sought after. So again, to just uh, reiterate my research project, it's really to find it, it can be potentially more effective due to its subversive offline simplicity and perhaps a more democratic and accessible solution for those who are less technically privileged, like myself. Um, and the question that I ask is, can lo-fi DIY analog obsolete be repurposed, called into action to compensate for the weakness of digital technology? Um, and in fact, in um, 2014, during the NSA spying revelations, German typewriter makers such as Bandermann Mann and Olympia have cited climbing sales. Um, during the time, also, according to this article, parliament members were seriously considering, considering abandoning email and returning to old school typewriters for sensitive documents. Speaking of typewriters, <laughs> I found this interesting piece of um, media archaeology. It's a uh, Barbie typewriter E118, and it was produced right here in Slovenia by a toy company called Mehano. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. 
So what's so special about this Barbie typewriter is that it has these electro electronic variants that have a hidden built-in cryptographic cap capability that allows for secret writing. So if any of you or your um, sisters or brothers have one of these lying at home, I'm willing to buy it <laughs> from you. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to show you this because I thought it was really nice. <laughs> so to now really get down to the more kind of technical aspects of steganography, I'm going to give you a bit of a lesson uh, since we're at a school. Um, so steganography is, as you can see, a part of a, a, a form of secret writing, just like cryptography. Um, steganography is meant to hide messages. Uh, it's intended to provide secrecy, to conceal the presence of a message itself. So the fact that the message is there is unknown to um, a passerby. Whereas the difference with cryptography is that the way it um, hides its message is to scramble it. So it's intended to provide privacy through the use of codes and ciphers, meaning that um, you can still tell if um, it's had an encrypted uh, method to it because it looks like gibberish, whereas steganography is invisible. It looks like nothing's ever happened. So you can further ca categorize steganography under these two main um, titles. So you can have linguistic steganography that uses language or semantics to um, kind of hide the message. And the other type is technical steganography um, and invisible ink falls under that category. The basic principles of steganography consists of various elements. One of them is the cover, which is the public um, face. It can be a letter or an envelope or billboard, newspaper, a painting, um, music, basically anything that looks unsuspecting uh, in public. And it can be hidden, uh, the hidden message is of course the second layer of information and this can be used, it can be done using invisible ink for example. And then you have the stego key which is the piece of information to unlock or decode um, the larger message to look to see the, the hidden message. And all of these components together form the stego object. So um, invisible inks can be made in various ways and invisible inks are basically inks that are invisible until activated and activation can happen in four different methods. One is optical, other one is thermal, mechanical and chemical. Um, optical method uses, um, is, becomes visible in contact with UV light Thermal is when it, become, when it comes in contact with heat. Mechanical is with, uh, for example, ob like mm, water or dust or um, particles. And chemical is through chemical process or chemical reaction. So what can be activated by heat is um, vinegar, lemon or milk. And when you use it to write on a piece of paper, you let it dry, you put it over um, some form of heat, the ink becomes brown because it kind of cooks faster. I don't know the technical or the, the kind of chemical process. You have to ask a chemist for that, but this is what happens. <laughs> um, what can be activated chemically is, through, uh, is lemon juice or baking soda um, in contact with uh, red cabbage juice and what's interesting about red cabbage juice is that it's a natural pH indicator Meaning that when it gets in contact with acid or lemon it turns a kind of red bright orange color not orange red color and When it's in contact with baking soda or something more alkaline it turns a blue green color and everything in between forms this rainbow spectrum very pretty um, great for invisible ink artists <laughs> Um, what, can, what else can be activated chemically is iodine um, when it's in contact with starch uh, and that can be you know, cornstarch, potato starch or rice starch. Um, any of these starches are um, effective and when they um, are in contact they form this very vivid blue color which is also known as the starch iodine complex. 
You can also activate by UV light uh, with saliva, urine, or plasma, which is the white part of blood, so not the red part, obviously. <laughs> and um, yeah, it becomes fluid when it when it gets um, when it gets in contact with UV light. What's interesting about body fluid is that in World War One, the British Foreign Intelligence were also experimenting with this um, because if you had uh, because you couldn't get incriminated if you possessed these substances since they belong to the body and they couldn't you couldn't be proven guilty for carrying these substances because indeed if you were caught with something that did indicate that you were carrying these substances which meant that you were a spy you could have been executed which is exactly what happened in this historical example from world war 1 so um, a group of German spies in Britain in World War I were caught using lemon juice to write and send secret messages. And many of them were shot one by one in the Tower of London. Um, this particular image is of that 100-year-old lemon, and it's held in the British archive. <laughs> it's very black. Um, so yeah, they were killed for using lemon. I mean, they could have just, you know, had some shots of tequila and, you know, <laughs> been in the wrong place in the wrong time. But, um, so invisible ink can also be hidden on the skin. And um, according to this book, which is all about the history of invisible ink, I will just show it like this. You can't see it because it's black. Um, the author describes that uh, women were more likely to carry it because they were less likely to be body searched. Um, this is also a, an example from World War I. So much like the NSA today, the British postal censorship during World War I was all pervasive and had its imperial, imperial tentacles stretched out from England and Europe to the Horn of Africa and the Caribbean. And this image is taken in Bermuda. So instead of pattern recognizing algorithms that filter through emails, 100 years ago, women were hired to sift the mail letter by letter because they were thought to have a sixth sense. Um, as you can see, they also had what I call desktop chemistry labs to uncover letters. This is yet another um, technique called the Cardin Grill, and it's a 400-year-old method, which is one of the most safest forms of communication. Um, what it is, it's a grid made out of cardboard with holes cut in it, and when the grill is placed over a larger message, the holes line up with specific letters in the message, revealing the hidden message within. Um, also tellingly, up until a few decades ago in Holland, uh, where I live, banks were still sending PIN codes um, of their customers in this way through mail. So yeah, it's, it's not as um, obsolete as uh, I thought. Um, this is um, a Chinese political meme, and in the last few years, uh, they can be seen as a form of linguistic, or more specifically, phonetic um, steganography as a way to evade online censorship. So in restrictive conditions, Chinese citizens creatively communicate through wordplay, number play in order to discuss politically and culturally sensitive topics while bypassing bans. And one of the main reasons why memes that are image-based slip through uh, these filters is because it's harder for algorithms to detect nuances and subtleties of humor and language. Um, and this particular example is the grass mud horse meme, which started in 2009 and has become a symbol of resistance towards online censorship. So in Chinese, if you pronounce grass mud horse slightly differently, it sounds like fuck your mother. Um, and so this kind of spread like wildfire across the Chinese internet and it um, encountered many uh, remixes, a YouTube um, song um, about the creature, a cartoon, a nature, document, nature documentary, 
um, currency even, poems, t-shirts, logos, etc. So this is one of my favorite examples. It's what I call subversive decoration. So it's a cross stitch made by a Nazi prisoner which uh, was never found out by his Nazi captors. And the decorative pattern in the frame is in fact a secret message in Morse code, spelling out God save the king and fuck Hitler. Lots of fucks. <laughs> um, it uses a combination of techniques uh, such as substitution cipher, so that's the Morse code, and it further camouflages this into the ornament, which is a type of semantic steganography. Um, another example in which uh, this kind of hybrid combination techniques is used is this uh, example. Um, so in a press conference, in a Vietnamese press conference, an American prisoner of war was forced to answer questions about his living conditions and he uses his eyes to blink torture while verbally he's expressing um, that he was treated well with enough food and water. So there is two levels of communication, one with his eyes literally spelling out torture and the other one with his mouth saying I'm fine uh, in front of the camera. So this specific work became intertwined in one of my own pieces and this particular work is called Too Long to Read and Write. Um, this work really looks at, or one of the main questions that this work looks at is how can we use the body to mask itself? And it imagines a potential language based on obsolete um, modern shorthands, emojis, facial expressions to conceal information as a way to evade um, surveillance technology like facial detection software. Um, for one of the first works that I made with Invisible Ink is called um, Media Archaeology of Steganography. And this particular work uses three different inks with three different activation methods um, as a way to kind of strengthen the security. So you need to have, let's say, you have to like spray it and iron it and put some other liquid on it in order to get the whole message. And um, the disclosure of this work happens on two levels. The first level is that the print itself becomes activated. And while activating the print, there's also the uncovering of tactical and strategic history of invisible ink itself. So this is the kind of print that, um, that appeared when you activated it. I will just show you a short video of how this happened. So that's it. So based on this principle, I have this idea of developing a printer in which I take an ordinary inkjet printer and take out the, the ink and then instead inject it with invisible ink into the cartridge um, as a way to focus not on necessarily making art, but making it accessible for anyone to use at home. This particular work was done with silkscreen, which is very time consuming and um, uh, expensive versus, for example, if the idea is that if you develop a printer in which you can use at home very readily, it can, let's say, um, encourage the use of um, invisible ink in a modern day um, method. So, 
Another work that fits within this um, body of work is this particular one called Greetings from the Invisible Borderland. It uses the Cardin Grill, um, it starts, or it's based on the Cardin, Cardin Grill, but it's intended to um, get, give it new value and urgency to this old technique. And instead of sending messages, and send, instead of sending both the card and letter over the post, um, I, I decided to separate these two elements and send one via the internet and one via the postal service. And the reason being is that perhaps it's harder to, to detect by interceptors. And so the way it works is that I send an invitation email with instructions and these instructions give you um, the message how to decode the process once you have the postcard, which is in fact the key. So um, once you have the postcard, which is the key, you cut it out and you have a cover image, which is actually a location on Google Maps. And then once you align the postcard on the screen, the message appears. So in this way, there is both digital and analog components to de deciphering or decoding the secret message, like this. So the design itself also uses visual trickery, um, such as camouflage, as a way to also embed a part of the message onto the postcard itself. So um, yeah, there is various layers, like two and a half layers of information going on there. This is the newest version I made for the show. Um, it uses the same graphical or symbolic language as um, the Kandinsky Collective, which is the show that will open tomorrow, and I invite you guys to come. So I'm just going to end with a little anecdote. I won't say too much because you have to come and see it for yourself. But this anecdote is based on a, a false memory of Florian Kramer, who was my supervisor during the beginning of my research. And he is, by the way, also the author of a brochure accompanying the show, which is called Hiding in Plain Sight. So I'm just going to quote from him now. Um, in a spy operation, British intelligence officer, in a stroke of genius, found abstract paintings to be the perfect carriers for secret messages. For this purpose, he commissioned a painting to Wassily Kandinsky, enclosing secret messages encoded in a manner of flag signs and Morse code into its seemingly abstract shapes. So to end, my exhibition can be seen as a rereading of art history to offer a possible near future reality. Thank you. for you guys to continue um, decoding this evening. <laughs> so the game is yours. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 